the biggest competition, and you're actually seeing this with a lot of these disruptive technologies, right? The Zooms of the world, the Pelotons, anything where we are working inside. Um, but it's like the, you know, the real disruptor right now is real life, because I think people are actually starting to leave their homes, leave their apartments. Again, obviously, the CDC came out with that big announcement that if you've been vaccinated, you can now go out without a mask, whether you're outside or indoors. And I suspect, Akiko, that a lot of the speculation that we're seeing in these cryptocurrencies was people locked inside with these stimulus checks, and you couldn't go to Atlantic City, you couldn't go to Las Vegas. Right. But now all those dynamics are changing. So I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that reality or living in the real world again is your biggest competition with a lot of these quote unquote disruptive technologies. And I talk a lot of this on my podcast. I mean, having said that, though, Ryan, uh, you've got uh, Goldman Sachs coming out with a note saying that um, Bitcoin is an investable asset. You've got somebody like Ray Dalio saying he's dabbling in, in it just a bit. I mean, isn't there still a case on the institutional side, despite what we have heard about institutional money sort of moving out of cryptos? Well, I could make the same argument back in 08, 09 with the housing crisis. Big companies like Merrill Lynch, Lehman Brothers thought it was a great idea to leverage up mortgages on their balance sheet. And that didn't end well either. So just because big institutions are getting involved, I wouldn't necessarily say that's a good thing. Um, in fact, a lot of times when big institutions embrace a lot of these concepts, they're usually late to the party, especially in the financial world. So I would be really careful about that because at the end of the day, if you, you know, break it down fundamentally, you know, it's still a horrible store value of money. You know, I run a business. I couldn't imagine if I was looking at my cash position every day and I had it in Bitcoin and, you know, all of a sudden it's down 50 percent and I've got my bills to pay. One of the reasons why Tesla, I suspect, you know, stopped taking payment in crypto uh, for their Teslas. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's still 75% of all transactions are for illicit transactions. And I have to think, you know, central banks, they love to control the money supply. Call me crazy, but I just don't think they're going to give that up a key go. I know that sounds crazy, but I, you know, at this point, I just don't think that's going to happen. When you look at the fundamentals in the market, is, is inflation still the key risk? And if that's the case, um, what's the hedge for you? Well, I think, you know, look, the markets tend to, what history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme, as Mark Twain once said. And there's no secret. Inflation is real, right? It's not, quote unquote, transitory, like the Fed's telling you right now. I mean, you, don't, you just have to walk outside. You see what prices look like when it comes to lumber, when it comes to copper, it comes to even going to the grocery store at this point or ordering on seamless, as we know, they just mark it up. Uh, exponentially, you know, inflation is here. And the bigger part of inflation, the bigger factor is those labor costs going up. You know, you're seeing, you know, McDonald's, whether it's uh, a lot of these uh, food restaurants, they're, they're offering you a bonus just to come to the interview right now. So inflationary pressure is 100 percent real. Um, but if you look at it traditionally, you know, what works well when you have inflation? Well, you know, commodities do really, really well. And, you know, commodities have intrinsic value, like you actually need commodities uh, you know, in society, whereas crypto, I can't build a house with crypto, but I can definitely build it with lumber. <laughs> you know, um, you know, material stocks, any company that can raise their prices on you and the raw material costs go up. And we're already seeing that, right? That's why value stocks are dramatically outperforming this year. If you're Coca-Cola, um, you know, you can raise your prices on the consumer if you're Procter & Gamble. And they're already starting to happen. You're already starting to watch these earnings calls. They're saying our raw material costs are going up. And guess what? We're not that benevolent. We're going to raise prices on you. So, you know, stocks invariably, cyclical stocks are invariably a tremendous inflation hedge. They've been historically. Uh, and we know commodities are as well. And even commodity-based economies. So if you think of emerging markets, whether you're Brazil um, or you know, some of these other economies where they are based in commodities, they're going to benefit as well. So you have to have these kind of assets in your portfolio. Crypto has no history of being an inflation hedge. It, do, it just you know, it, it doesn't exist. So this, you know, belief that it's like the new gold, which by the way, gold's a horrible long-term investment. If you look at a hundred year history of gold, <laughs> it's actually done like 1% a year over inflation. It's a terrible hedge. So another horrible argument for why you shouldn't own crypto. So I think, you know, history already tells you what's going to work and you've got to embrace that, like all our portfolios. And again, we do talk about this like week after week on our podcast are diversified in all those inflation hedges and they're working. Big tech is going sideways. Meanwhile, value stocks are going up, commodities growing up. You know, the market's already telling you that's what's happening. Got to get those podcast plugs in, Ryan. I appreciate that. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, we know you've always been well, you've always been a value trader. Um, 
But I wonder what the breakdown is for you right now when you look at your portfolio. How much how much exposure to growth, and if so, um, what are some names that that you think have real upside even in this environment? You always have growth in your portfolio, so I'll put that caveat out there. We always have an exposure to growth in our portfolio. I still have big cap tech in there, but the bottom line is it's only a component of our portfolios. So you know, for our portfolios right now, you know, we have a we have an absolute healthy allocation to value stocks. And again, just like I mentioned before, owning companies like Procter & Gamble, old school companies, owning companies like Johnson & Johnson, uh, you know, old school pharmaceuticals, um, anything that's like a Pepsi, a Coke, right? Anywhere where, where they have price increases is great. Furthermore, and I think we're actually rare in this, is 40% of our portfolios are overseas. Because you gotta remember, foreign markets do just as well as the US market over time. And those companies tend to be more cyclical. Cyclical companies, again, benefit when you're in an inflationary environment. Furthermore, it comes down to value. If you look at foreign companies right now, they trade at much lower multiples than US companies. And it's crazy, but next year, GDP growth in Europe is going to be faster than the US. Now, I can get cheaper companies that pay, and the dividend increases are going to be higher this year as well, that are going to grow faster over the next couple of years. You know, I call that an offer you can't refuse. So the dollar's weakening is probably going to continue to weaken as money goes around the globe, and you've got to have that position in your portfolio as well. Like this is the this is the next decade of global investing, cyclical value stocks. Last decade was deflationary environment, large cap growth, tech. That party is over. 